the panels entitled tonight, Forced Migration, Violence, and Poverty in a Global Society, a panel discussion on world refugee and migration crisis. Forced migration. Forced migration is a global problem whose effects are very unevenly distributed across the world. The term forced migration refers to any of several groups of people who face circumstances that cause them to flee their home. Those who are refugees from war or social or economic unrest, asylum seekers who cannot return home for fear of persecution, internally displaced persons who must migrate to a different region in their own country, those displaced by development projects or policies such as dams and airports, those who are displaced by disasters, natural or human caused. It may also include smuggled or trafficked people. Forced migration is a problem nearly as old as human history. Persecution, ethnic cleansing, natural calamity, and war are attested in ancient textual and archeological evidence. But our situation today stands apart for a couple of reasons. First, we live in an era of tremendous and escalating crises of this sort. A 2012 report by the United Nations Refugee Agency reported an all-time high in the number of forced migrants around the globe at 45.2 million, an increase of nearly 3 million over the previous year. At that time, Syria was the major contributing factor to that increase, and those statistics in 2012 did not even include that year's new forced migrants. Since that time, forced migration within and out of Syria due to the four-year-old civil war and the spread of the Islamic State has continued to grow. Climate change, economic development in the formerly undeveloped world, uh, these are also exacerbating causes in forced migration um, rates caused by conflict. Second reason we stand apart in this era today when we think about forced migration is that we are party to a more recent development and perhaps one that is hopeful, one which this panel tonight reflects. Forced migration has, has attracted an increasing amount of attention as a category of crises all their own. NGOs, government ministries, and academics have turned their attention to forced migration as a constellation of related problems that must be addressed in terms of causes and solutions that may, they may have in common or that may be disparate. You, several universities in the West have recently approved degree programs in forced migration studies. Perhaps this portends a more coordinated and rationalized effort that can address this global reality. So we have here tonight a distinguished panel of faculty from Elon with a great variety of uh, expertise in and experience in the problems of forced migration. Um, immediately to my left is Dr. Haya Ajan, Assistant Professor of Management Information Systems. Uh, following her, we'll talk Dr. Musa Idris, uh, Assistant Professor of Anthropology here at Elon. Dr. Carmen Monaco, is Assistant Professor of Human Service Studies. Dr. Brian Niehaus is Associate Professor of Business Communication. And Dr. Tom Moy Islam is Assistant Professor of Economics. We are awaiting the arrival also of Dr. Ahmed Fadam, who will come um, and uh, offer some kind of summary comments uh, and reflections on the problem of forced migration. So thank you to our organizers. Thanks to all the panelists. And I will introduce Ameya to you. So thank you, Dr. Pennington, for that introduction. And thank you to our panelists and all of you who've shown out. This, uh, this has been an event that we've been planning since the summer, so glad to see a lot of you were able to attend. So right now, I want to open out the discussion to the audience, but I just want to start open out the discussion with two general questions. So to the panelists, forced migration has been an issue that's been in the news we've been hearing a lot lately. So from your different fields of interest and expertise, what are the different kinds of causes of forced migration? All right, well, I also would like to thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here. Uh, I am originally from Syria, and this topic is very close uh, and dear and near to my heart. Uh, the uh, accounts that I'll be sharing with you here are uh, all accounts through Syrian eye. It's not, I'm not a researcher in the area, I'm just Syrian, and I'm here to tell you what my people have been suffering. Um, 
I do have still a very large family as well in Syria, and I do talk to them on a daily basis. So again, some of the stories you'll hear are their stories. <clears throat> it's really hard to see a country that you grew up in collapse like this. Places that I have um, been in in Syria that I grew up in don't exist anymore. It's a very, very painful process. I don't know if you can take a second and kind of imagine what uh, every Syrian is going through right now. It's uh, very terrifying and uh, uh, helpless in many ways. I was uh, reading uh, in preparation for this uh, panel and I uh, came across a sentence that I want to share uh, with you of what a refugee is. Um, and uh, the question that the National Geographic actually article raises, what, what happens when you become a war refugee? And that's what happened today to Syrians. It said, so it begins. You take a step, you exit one life and enter another. You walk through a cut border fence into a state statelessness, vulnerability, dependency, and invisibility. You become a refugee. Like Dr. Pennington mentioned uh, earlier, the number of uh, Syrian uh, refugees has been uh, on the rise. In fact, today, uh, the latest numbers that have been registered are 3.8 million, which actually make this the largest humanitarian disaster of our time. Um, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee uh, Antonio uh, Gutierrez, he said, it's the worst people migration since Rwanda genocide 20 years ago, just to put it in perspective. Today, there are 12.2 million people in need for humanitarian assistance, 5.5 million children affected by the crisis in Syria, 7.6 million that are internally displaced, and the number continues to grow and about four million Syrian that have been displaced outside the country in refugee countries, in neighboring countries. The past four years in Syria have resulted in chaos. In chaos, that's uh, if the war stops today, it's gonna take us 30 years to rebuild the country. So what caused this in Syria? March is a very special month for the Syrians. March 15, 2011, just take you back in time, a, a Syrian uprising started. It was part of the Arab Spring. So what has happened is people were inspired that a change can happen after 40 years of dictatorship. We had the Assad regime in power for 40 years. First the father, then the son. And we were hopeful that change can happen if just people take out to the street peaceful demonstrators and ask the government for reforms. In the beginning, they actually didn't want to change the government. They just want reforms. But how did the government respond? The government was very violent. They started cracking down on the people demonstrators. They started shooting the demonstrators indiscriminately. Uh, there was an article that I always like to refer to and that was written in this era that said there is no humanity left in Syria. And the article describes piles and piles of people as the, uh, the uh, Syrian or the Assad army was shooting people. There were piles and piles and body, of bodies of peaceful demonstrators that had no weapons, that have just started uh, falling on top of each other. And uh, the world just watched. The world did nothing. Um, and this has resulted in uh, the, those demonstrators, the activists, started organizing. And they started carrying arms to protect themselves against the Assad regime. And from that, what happened, when people took arms, uh, there were some Syrian uh, army defectors that have defected from the army and started organizing. They were very decentralized in different cities in Syria. And uh, because of that, now you had two fighting groups. You had the Assad government fighting the people that were just carrying arms, started carrying arms, and some of them did not know how to use those arms. They were civilians that started carrying arms. So it was very chaotic. This has resulted in more violence. The Assad regime, the way they responded, they started using air. They started um, uh, basically, uh, the, you, you see in pictures and, and descriptions from my family how entire buildings were collapsing on top of people that they were living in. Families were dying. People were dying. 
and that forced people to uh, leave, to pick up their things and say, well, if I stay here, what happened to my family and my friends is going to happen to me. And when they're desperate enough, they just started leaving. And they left, they will just basically carry some clothes and sometimes they will go walking because they have no mean of traveling. They will walk for miles and miles, for days uh, and, and days. And they will walk typically through the night only because they're afraid of snipers and the Assad regime of capturing them. Uh, again, when I was preparing for this, I started looking at uh, refugee stories. And I encourage all of you to look at uh, uh, the UN has a website that's just for Syrian refugees. I encourage you to look at the pictures. You see through the pictures, the desperation people's eyes as they get to the borders, and sometimes, for example, the Turkish border or the Lebanese borders, and sometimes those borders close in their faces. So they walked for days and nights, risked their life. They may have died on the road. And then the refugee country or uh, the place that they thought would give them safety has closed its borders. Uh, there are so, so many pictures like that. I just encourage you to, to view those pictures so you can see how uh, people can be so desperate looking into uh, a safe place that really doesn't exist because of the situations that they have right there. Um, it's a really tough situation, what's happening in Syria. Typically, the Syrians are going to neighboring countries. They're going to Lebanon. They're going to Turkey. Uh, they're going to Jordan and Iraq. And majority of, uh, speaking out of Iraq, uh, <laughs> Dr. Fadam just walked in. Um, the majority of the, uh, the refugees right now are in Turkey. Uh, there are uh, about 1.7 million in Turkey refugees. There's 1.1 million in Lebanon. And uh, uh, in Jordan, uh, we are very close to the 1 million as well in Jordan. And I just want to put this in perspective for you. When we say that uh, Lebanon now has 1.1 million, it means that one of every five people that are living in Lebanon is actually a Syrian. So imagine the strain that this puts on the country, on the hosting country. So the reason it started in Syria, it was a hope for a better uh, world, for a democratic country, for an Arab Spring. And what Syrians got is a very cold winter that has been lasting forever. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amaya, for organizing this event. Um, my name is Musa Idris. Uh, I am a native of Eritrea, so I will be talking a little bit about Eritrea because most people tell me, like, Eritrea, what? Where is it? Uh, so to just give uh, a little bit of background uh, briefly, and then I will talk about my own experience. Um, as an asylum seeker in the United States. Uh, so Eritrea is located in East Africa. It was uh, part of Ethiopia until uh, 1991. Uh, but before that, Eritrea was an Italian colony. Uh, it was established in 1890. So until 1941, uh, it was an Italian settler colony. But in the Second World War, when uh, Italy was defeated by Great Britain, Eritrea was administered by uh, uh, English administration from 1942 to 1951. And then Ethiopia uh, ruled Eritrea from 1952 uh, to 1991. So when Ethiopia ruled uh, Eritrea, uh, the colonial uh, legacy did not disappear. So from 1961 to 1991, it took long years of war. So you know, I was uh, born in 1974. From 1974 to 1991, all I saw was wars. Um, wars happening between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. Uh, on the Eritrean side, uh, trying to claim independence. On the Ethiopian side, try to unite Ethiopia and Eritrea together, so um, officially. Uh, Eritrea was the 14th province of Ethiopia, um, particularly uh, in the 1980s, because to, today we are talking about refugees. Um, many people were fleeing uh, from Eritrea for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, 
Ethiopia, after 1974, uh, started to be ruled by a socialist government. Uh, and any people who oppose the uh, socialist regime, they were getting persecuted. Um, and the other part of it is uh, because there was ethnic conflicts uh, inside Eritrea uh, between uh, Eritreans and Ethiopians, and that led for um, uh, refugees to uh, go to uh, neighboring countries, to Sudan, uh, to uh, Somalia, uh, and the entire region uh, was affected by what was going on uh, in the Cold War that, that, that was happening. Uh, and it was, again, uh, exacerbated by the internal uh, ethnic uh, conflicts as well. Um, and then uh, when Eritrea became independent, uh, people went and voted after two years. They, they said that we want our independence. Uh, but you know, independence is one thing, nation building is another thing. Uh, so when uh, Eritrea was uh, undergoing this process of nation building, uh, there was a, a, a party that was created in the country. It's called the uh, PFDJ. Uh, it uh, refers to People's Front for Democracy and Justice. Uh, the name sounds very good. Uh, in reality, it's very repressive. It's uh, dictatorial. It doesn't allow uh, democratic election system to happen. Uh, Eritrea was hoping to have a constitution in 1997, but that was suspended. And the reason why it was suspended was uh, it was given that Ethiopia and Eritrea needed to define their border. Uh, and the problem is that they wanted to settle the problem uh, in the battlefield. So 1998 uh, to, to, to 2000, uh, there was, a, again, re-emergence of conflict. Uh, personally, uh, I finished my high school in 1994. Uh, I joined the University of Asmara. Uh, and I, I finished it in 1999. Um, and for one year, I did a national service uh, in Eritrea, like all uh, individuals above the age of 18. They are required to do national service for 18 months, which includes six months of military training and 12 months uh, of national service. But in reality, it is open, like it's indefinite. And the justification that's given by the government is that we are no, uh, we, we don't have peace, we don't have no, we don't have war. So it's, we are in between. So it can be uh, unextended, it's a justification for uh, not opening, uh, you know, the, the country for uh, democracy or for election. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to be able to come to the United States in 2000 because I was able to get a scholarship, uh, USAID scholarship, uh, to come to the University of Florida. And as a commitment, uh, when you are an exchange student, you have to go back to your country. Uh, went back to Eritrea. Uh, I was teaching at the University of Asmara uh, from 2002 up to 2005. Uh, there was only one university in the country. But the government decided to shut down the university. Uh, and the reason is that because people started asking questions. You know, that's what you do when you are a university student. You ask questions and, and professors also, uh, once you are exposed about uh, democracy, uh, issue of social justice, human rights, you encourage your students to ask questions and that resulted to persecution. So when uh, it was, unsafe for me because of my political opinions. I, I had to decide to leave Eritrea and come back uh, to the United States. So I came back um, and uh, to, the, to the University of Florida, started my, doing my PhD. And uh, that was the time when I started applying for my political asylum in the United States. Uh, as you know, the, the requirement for the political asylum is that you need to have a well-founded fear of persecution. Uh, it could be for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. In my case, uh, it was the difference between my belief uh, in democracy, in openness, and on the other hand, the uh, People's Front for Democracy and Justice, uh, which is the only party in Eritrea, uh, that is basically the government that's persecuting its own people. Um, and what is different uh, about 
you know, the current asylum seekers and refugees that are coming from Eritrea, uh, unlike the one that I told you in 1980s, is that because um, after 2009, uh, what's happening is uh, there was the Arab Spring happening uh, in Egypt. Uh, the government uh, was uh, overthrown by the movement. So there was uh, nomads called the, uh, the Bedouin nomads who started uh, you know, uh, human trafficking. Uh, inside Eritrea, you have corruption. Uh, and you know, in, in the neighboring country, North Sudan, uh, where also they have uh, uh, you know, refugees uh, in, coming from different parts of the world, including from Eritrea, more than 100,000. Uh, so this became like a recipe for a good market, basically, for human traffickers. Uh, so when Eritreans are living from Eritrea, they have to cross through difficult deserts, uh, even all the way to Libya. Uh, uh, in, in Libya, there is, they, there is also a collapse of government. And then from Libya, they try to cross through Mediterranean to Europe. So the, you can imagine uh, how complicated and how difficult uh, it's becoming for Eritrean uh, refugees to make it to Europe. Uh, so in my case, uh, when I applied, my uh, application, I had to wait for about two years because you know the, the asylum application process is uh, done case by case. Uh, at that time, I was still a student, uh, and after waiting for um, the oral testimony uh, and personal testimony that you have to do uh, or in immigration office, go through the paperwork. Uh, honestly, I was very fortunate because I had the ability to go to school. I can do research. Uh, I can ask, uh, you know, colleagues uh, from the law school uh, who helped me find out places for, you know, legal advices uh, where you know people can do pro bono because it can be very expensive if you pay uh, lawyers by yourself. Uh, so the current situation in Eritrea, like you ask, why people become uh, refugees or asylum seekers? Uh, in the case of Eritrea, it. It's worse. It's also a restriction of freedom of speech. Uh, the indefinite national service is basically conscription of people to work uh, in uh, mining sectors that are owned by uh, the government officials. There is a persistent religious persecution in Eritrea. For example, if you have, a, if you believe in, um, uh, if you are a Jehovah Witness, you get persecuted just because of your belief. Uh, there is, you know, uh, arbitrary arrest uh, because there is no constitution. Uh, you cannot claim that, you know, you can go to court uh, and make your uh, case heard. So, you know, it's very difficult uh, situation. And maybe if you have more questions, I can elaborate. Uh, so in the interest of time, I can stop here. Thank you. Well, like the two previous speakers, I'm also coming from a country where forced migration has been the norm in the last 30 years, actually. So um, I'm from El Salvador in Salvadoran uh, uh, people and they were in uh, 25 years of war that resulted in uh, 75,000 people um, killed and more than a million um, uh, displaced. Um, there was a lot of internal displacement, and this is the people that uh, actually as a first year college student, I was trying to help, and, uh, and that got me into trouble, and that's the reason I'm here. So um, many of uh, the uh, people that I encounter with and um, were forced actually to leave their homes and their communities because of continued um, bombing and scorch earth operations that were taking place in the countryside. Um, they were fleeing uh, personal persecution because of being community leaders, because of being labor representatives and uh, people addressing actually their needs and uh, uh, claiming for, for justice for the long one, the loved ones who were being disappeared during that, that civil war. So um, 
Salvadorians that fled to the U.S. actually uh, continue to face a long journey of, of uh, despair and, and also persecution, uh, especially by those who are trafficking, uh, uh, smuggling into the country and trafficking uh, humans through across the border. So there are many uh, uh, now resources and documentation about what happens to uh, those who are crossing the border through Mexico. And uh, I think my colleague Brian is going to talk more about that. But um, it, needless to say, the story that I am um, telling you, I lived in my um, very early years um, as a, uh, an adolescent. It's, it's a story that actually uh, many uh, Central Americans, particularly from Guatemala, and uh, uh, Honduras and, uh, and also El Salvador have been living in the last uh, a few years. So we have, uh, uh, last summer, a, a, a tremendous increase in the number of unaccompanied minors crossing the borders. Just uh, during that period, um, about 66,000 um, did that. And uh, a, this were, um, minors and children who were um, as, early, as, as uh, young as five years old, and uh, uh, minors who were uh, with their, their mothers or some kind of relatives, and, and then very young people who were either looking to reunite with their relatives here, or uh, they were escaping from uh, violence in, in Central America. So why are they coming here? And uh, it's the same reasons that uh, um, the first wave of uh, immigrants actually came. In fact, the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees conducted a study um, of some of these uh, unaccompanied minors when they were in detention in 2000 and, and uh, a, a, a year ago than, than the humanitarian crisis, actually. So 58% uh, they found have potential or actual international protection needs. 48% um, have been affected by violence from organized criminal actors, particularly gangs. And because after the civil wars in those countries, the violence increased, and uh, it, it was especially through gangs. 21% um, have survived abuse and violence in their homes. So um, the reasons why then uh, many of these children have been fleeing I, um, are, are kind of evidenced in that uh, study. And also in the now interviews that have been conducted by lawyers who are representing them. So um, I believe that situation, I've seen what is going on uh, to this other generation of, of minors. And, uh, and I'm beginning to do some, some scholarship, actually, on, on this issue. And what I found is that um, um, although there have been drastic measures of, of uh, a, a preventing migration, uh, the reality is that the, the, the prospects of diminishing the number of uh, a, unaccompanied minors a, seeking, you know, asylum and seeking other forms of protection, it doesn't seem to be uh, winding down. Uh, there has been in uh, 2000, as compared to 2009, for example, where from those three countries, over 3,000 uh, were detained in uh, in the southern border. Um, in 2013, 20,000 were detained. Uh, 2014, 51,000. And just in the last, uh, in the, the first four months of the fiscal year 15, 6,000. So um, the projection is that actually the, or the trend seems to be increasing and uh, um, more actually uh, Hondurans are going to be, seem to be, the, or the, the, the uh, incoming, the apprehension of Hondurans seems to be decreased, but the reality is that 
um, those from Guatemala continue to come. So um, I will talk a little bit more later about uh, some of the, the prevention uh, to migration that uh, efforts that have been carried out in the last uh, few years and the impact on the communities later of all of these uh, refugees. Thanks. Thanks, Carmen. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Brian Niehaus, and I teach in the School of Business. And uh, the remarks I prepared for this evening, uh, I prepared them with this vision of students in the audience, and I see a few. But I see a mixture of, uh, you know, I've got various generations here. So, so uh, um, let, well, let's see if what I've prepared actually can, can reach all, uh, all generations. Um, first thing I wanted to say to the students in the audience is that I came to Elon in 1999. And <clears throat> I was very similar to most Elon students in that um, if you were to ask me what part of the world I was most interested in, I would have answered Europe. Uh, Elon students right now, if you poll them, you know, most of them, if they want to study abroad, they want to go to Europe, right? Which, uh, yeah, okay. So, so we were soul buddies back then, but I, I, have, I regret to say to my, my Elon students here that we're no longer soul buddies because uh, at this stage in my life, my, my opinion of Europe is they'll take care of themselves. <laughs> and since coming to Elon, I have come to be increasingly interested in other parts of the world, and probably through accidents of circumstance, uh, Central and South America. Thanks to uh, Dr. Donovan Bodegraven, I was uh, privileged enough to accompany Elon students to study abroad programs in the Yucatan Peninsula, beginning in 2000, um, and continuing for a few years after that. Then, uh, I, you know, you'll, you'll learn that I have very little imagination. I started taking business fellows to the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico as well. And a few years ago, I was a Periclean scholars mentor. And where do you guess I took my Pericleans uh, during their senior year? Well, I took them to Chiapas as well as to, as to the Yucatan. Uh, my heart and soul now, I would say, is uh, firmly located in that part of the world. So the, I think Amaya asked a really important question, and that is, what are the causes of, uh, of um, forced migration. And the particular re way I'm going to respond reflects something that I think Elon students and Elon faculty will understand. And that is that for those of us who study global issues, there's a tendency to focus on global issues when something really bad has happened. A civil war um, used to be the Cold War, um, <clears throat> a drought, a tsunami, and so on. So that um, there is there does form in the mind of some students and even some faculty this notion of disaster fatigue. We only pay attention to international events when something terrible has happened. And I've kind of taken that as a little secret challenge in my own, when I teach a global experience class or when I take students uh, uh, abroad. I, my, my, my question is, well, if there is no terrible disaster, what is it that we should be looking at? <laughs> And it's not an easy question to answer, but I wanted to finish my intervention this evening with a story, and a story that, that ends with a question. And the story itself, and also the responses we might come up to to the question, kind of illustrate the things that are increasingly interesting me as I continue to follow um, the events in, in this part of the world that's, that's new, new yet dear to me. So here's the story. I want you to, I was, if it was all students, I would say close your eyes, but you, you, don't, you don't have to. But imagine a mountain valley, okay? And um, the kind of mountain valley I'd like you to imagine is one that's got a nice little river flowing down the middle of it, nice green area in the valley itself, and maybe sloping, the mountains aren't too tall, but tall enough so that you call them mountains, okay? Sloping up the mountains, you still see green pasture-like land, and maybe you see nice trees, pine trees or something like that, along both sides of the, of the mountains, okay? So imagine a mountain valley like that. If you um, happen to arrive at this mountain valley, I want you to imagine um, some campesinos, okay? Um, you may, if it's, uh, 
in February or March of, and, and it's Central America, you may see campesinos taking sticks and poking them in the ground and then pulling a mixture of corn, bean, and squash seeds out of a satchel and you know, throwing them into the, to the holes that they've made in the ground, okay? And, uh, hmm, okay. So if you're a visitor and you see that, you know, you're, you're seeing a pretty, um, a pretty um, low-tech version of a subsistence uh, farming operation in this val in this mountain valley. Okay, so now what do I want you to imagine next? I want you to imagine a uh, a concerned, educated member of say a um, the Ministry of Economics of this country. We, I'm not going to name a particular country, who um, is concerned with developing the economy of of her country. Okay. She's been well-educated in economic development theory. So she knows what an efficient operation is and what an inefficient operation is, okay? She learns of this mountain valley and she's told of these people who are poking sticks in the ground and planting corn and she does a little investigating and lo and behold she finds out, yep, just as she suspected, there are about a thousand people living in this valley. They barely produce enough for some of the local village markets. Maybe a few extra bushels of corn, some beans and things like that. But if you add up the economic productivity of this val these people in this valley, it's not very much. She has learned from her studies, and maybe from a representative from the World Bank, who knows, that you can use land much more efficiently if, you, um, if it gets enough rainfall and it's green, you can run cattle in that same valley. So I want you to imagine that um, this particular country manages a change, a transition, if you will. They remove the campesinos from the land, and they allow the land then to be managed or owned by uh, some ranching families. Okay? Now, when you start ranching the land in this same valley, what happens? It doesn't take nearly as many people to manage those cattle who are eating that green grass in that valley. So if you measure the economic productivity now of that valley, you'll find that the economic productivity has increased immensely, okay? And the, uh, that now the, minister, the person in this ministry of, of um, the economy is able to report that a certain amount of beef is being produced in this valley, not only enough to help supply the, the domestic market, but a lot of that beef now is available for export so that the country is earning uh, currency from the export of that beef. Follow me so far in this story? My question to you is, does this story have a happy ending or a sad ending? Okay. What could po and I would ask the students in the audience, is there anything wrong with this story? And I'll leave it at that and wait for your answers afterward. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Tan Islam, and I am a professor, assistant professor of economics here, and I'm originally from Bangladesh. Uh, it's a tiny country in South Asia. It's between sandwich between India and Burma slash Myanmar. So um, one reason, uh, one thing that uh, Mia asked me to talk about is about like what are the economic reasons behind migration or behind forced migration. So there are some reasons that we see. The world today has never been wealthier. As a global community, we are probably in the most richest point in our history. And this wealth keeps on increasing. With this creates stark differences in living standards across the world. You have countries where income is very high. For example, one of the richest countries in the world is Qatar. Average income there is over $100,000 per person, so very wealthy people. But on the other hand, you have countries like Congo where average income is $500 a year. So that's less than what a lot of us pay as rent. And so you have this huge stark differences, but with globalization, with ease of communication, with more trading happening, people are realizing that there is a huge differences in living standards. And people who live in the poorer parts of the world, they want to try their luck and they want to see if moving to a wealthier country 
can help to not only improve their lives, but also improve the lives of their families back home. So, of course, there are people who will take advantage of that, and these people are middlemen. What they try to do is they promise them a, some sort of a passageway from country A to country B via country C, D, E, F, G. So you have people, let's say, from Congo who are being promised to go to Europe, somewhere in Europe, but they have to pass through very treacherous grounds in order to reach um, the shores of the Mediterranean, and then they take a boat to go to the other side. The problem is they have to pay a lot of money for that, and sometimes what they do is they take the loan, and they have to pay back the loan with very high interest rates. And what happens then is that they become bonded laborers. So they spend their whole life trying to basically pay back the loan. So, and, that's, and this is happening because there's always a demand for cheap labor. This just doesn't have from, uh, happen from Africa to Europe. It also happens within Asia, within a country. Um, for example, uh, one NGO in India said that there are about 40 million people in India alone that is forced into some degree of bonded labor. Their family took a loan, and now they can't repay it back. So this person is effectively working for a family um, for free, basically just to repay the loan. Sometimes that's how forced migration happened, where forced, and basically people are being forced to work in those areas. Or sometimes they, ha or they are lured to, let's say, the Middle East, promised a good job, but they are trapped there because the employers basically take away their passports, and you can't change jobs. In some of the Middle Eastern countries, you need an exit visa to leave the country, so you can't even escape. So you're basically trapped there. You're promised a high wage when you left the your home country, but you're not earning that when you're there. You live in very squalid conditions, and you're trying to basically repay back the loan that you took. So this is one degree, I mean, even though they went to those countries willingly, but now they're trapped and they're forced to stay there repaying back their loans. And this has happened a lot of times. Of course, there's a lot of instances of physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse. A lot of people are trafficked into, not only in those parts of the world, also in the United States, people are trafficked into the country and they're forced into prostitution or they're forced to work as bonded workers in many of the agriculture sectors. So, and that's what's happening. And one survey by the International Labor Organization, which is an organization under the United Nations, they said that about 20.9 million people in the world are employed as forced labor. But then again, I said in India alone, there is a, a, a statistic that says that about 40 million. So this probably is a very underestimate of the number of people who are forced into labor or into forced labor. However, um, the United Nations also found out that $150 billion is generated from this kind of forced labor. So you're basically taking people, making them work in very, very squalid conditions, giving them very little or no rights. One classic example we see now is in Qatar. They're building stadiums for the World Cup, and you have um, correspondents that kind of sneak into w the slums where the workers are living, and you see them that they're living in deplorable conditions. They work 12, 14 hours a day. Um, they don't get what they have paid, but they can't even leave. That's the problem. So they're forced to remain there, trying to pay off the debt that they took. Now, that's one aspect of it. It's basically the economic reasons. I want a better life. That's why I want to move to a better country, and hopefully I will change my fate. And so this is happening from uh, Latin America into the United States, from Africa to Europe, within Asia. People also are trying to get on boats to go to Australia. There are different reasons for that too, but not just from the war side. The other side is also climate change. Because of climate changes that's happening, there are certain communities that are having poor harvest, and there is rising salinity in the water. So before, farming communities that were self-sufficient are not able to grow their enough food. Especially a country like mine, in Bangladesh, um, there's rising salinity, and especially the areas that are near the shorelines, those communities are being affected uh, negatively. And so what they're doing is that they're moving to cities. So this is a kind of a migration. They, were, they don't have any skills uh, that helps them to maintain a good life in the city. They are farmers. Cities don't need farmers. So they have to etch a living through any means possible. So 
there are different. So these are the two main economic reasons why people might be forced to um, migrate to other countries. And there are, of course, middlemen who take advantage of that, lure them that, you know what, we can, I can get you a good job, but then they end up being bonded laborers in many parts of the world. I would like you to join me just thanking our panelists for speaking with us today. And I'd also like to invite our concluding speaker, Dr. Ahmed Fadam. Thanks so much. Um, some of you may know me. I see some of my students here, and uh, uh, some of you may not. I'm, my name is Ahmed uh, Abdullah Fadam. I'm from Iraq, and uh, I'm a refugee myself. Uh, I just arrived to the United States in 2012 uh, with my family. I came from Baghdad, uh, from Iraq. And I uh, just wanted to tell you a story about uh, uh, my experience with refugees. Uh, uh, I was born in 1967 and uh, lived most of my life in Iraq. And during the 70s and the 80s, we used to hear a lot about Palestinian refugees in Iraq and how they are living uh, in difficult situations and how they are uh, undocumented and how they are not finding jobs and uh, all of that. And we used to say, why don't they go back to their country? What's the big deal? I mean, uh, refugees, refugees, they all whine all the time until the time came and we became refugees because of the war uh, and because of the violence that happened in Iraq. Uh, me and my family uh, had to leave the country. And of course, I was one of the lucky ones. There are millions of refugees from Iraq and from Syria also because of the violence. Many of them are living in uh, refugee camps in very difficult situations. Uh, for me, I was so lucky to land here at Elon to find me a job and to live a decent and stable life. But what about the rest of them, the rest of the refugees? Well. A lot of organizations in the world are doing their best to help with the refugees, like UNHCR, uh, the uh, World Food, Food Program, uh, the Red Crescent, the Red Cross, mm -hmm. all of those. Uh, but as I said, they're doing their best. They're trying to find ways to help these people, maybe to find them places to uh, start a new life. Uh, countries like here in the United States, or maybe in Europe. But what, the question is, what are these countries doing? Uh, they are, and they have all the rights to do so, they, they are thinking about their countries and about their uh, people also, about their economy, about their culture, about their way of life, and they cannot just uh, open the door and accept one million refugees all at once. Right? This is uh, what's happening there. And it's so difficult. But uh, what about the refugees themselves? Or should we just close an eye and uh, leave them uh, like this? Or should we do something to help them? Um, many of those refugees, and I'm talking here from experience. Uh, in 2007, I had to send my family uh, to Syria. Uh, because I got a death threat, and uh, the death threat wasn't against me alone, but it was against my family. They threatened to kill my kids and my wife. And uh, I went to Syria several times, and Syria was one of the very few countries who opened their borders for the Iraqi refugees. They helped in uh, uh, sheltering them, to feed them, to give them uh, aids, and to sometimes give them jobs. But the Iraqi refugees who left Iraq, many of them had to sell their properties, uh, lose their jobs, uh, their savings, all of that, and uh, to go to Syria. Then the conflict happened in Syria, and these same refugees who found shelter in Syria had to go back to Iraq because they had nowhere else to go. And now they're, they have nothing, because they have sold everything and lost everything. And now we have uh, uh, other threats against them, uh, beside living in, in, in tents, we have 
uh, terrorist organizations like ISIS and others who are also creating more problems for refugees and displacing more uh, in Iraq and in Syria. So, and as I said, uh, many organizations in the world are doing their best and many countries have accepted uh, some of these refugees to, uh, in their countries. But is this enough? Um, I checked the UNHCR uh, website today. Uh, I was you know, curious to find out the number of some statistics about refugees. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> and the uh, numbers were shocking. Uh, I can easily say millions of people who are being displaced right now. Uh, uh, Dr. Ajan also talked about uh, the uh, UNHCR program and uh, their uh, lack of funds right now. Mm -hmm. And you said uh, they need something like $7 billion? $8.5 billion. $8 billion. Uh, is it a lot? Uh, seven point eight point uh, five million uh, dollars is, uh, in my opinion, is not a lot, considering the uh, wealth uh, many of these countries have, especially in the Middle East, uh, Gulf countries. Uh, if each of these governments would, uh, uh, you know, send a million a billion dollars to uh, the uh, UNHCR program, it's not going to be have any effect on their economy. But what they, why they are so reluctant to do so? Um, I don't want to get into uh, a political discussion uh, about this, but uh, this is the truth and this is what's happening right now. The question is, uh, what are we going to do about it? If our governments are not helping, uh, if the uh, international organizations are uh, not doing enough, what should we do about it? Just something for you to think about. Thank you. 